and are throughout. Nearly one in four people use social media worldwide. This information was taken from the website eMarketer in 2013 with an increase in numbers yearly. My proposition states that social media has changed our culture amongst young adults in America negatively. The three claims are being made and they are that social media is addictive, cyberbullying results from social media, and social media diminishes privacy. I want everyone to think of how many times they used a social media platform just today. Now I'd like you all to think of a young adult that has at least one form of social media on their phone or online. A lot of names might have come across in your mind. Anyone can easily think of a friend or someone that they know that uses social media. Now I'd like you all to think of someone that does not have a form of social media. The number is a lot smaller now, isn't it? A study done by Pew Research Center states that 71% of teens use more than one social network site, aged from 13 to 17 in America. This brings me to my first claim, that social media is addictive. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Google+, Vine, and Tumblr are the leading sources of social media usage amongst teens in that particular order. The Pew Research Center indicates that of these teenagers, 71% use Facebook, 52% use Instagram, and 41% use Snapchat. Teenagers tend to diversify their usage of social media and oftentimes do not just stick to one form of social media. The website Adweek also states that users between the ages of 15 to 19 spend at least three hours a day on average on social media. This is three hours taken from the day to simply browse any social media site. I can't even begin to explain the number of times I stopped working on this assignment to browse social media. I can only imagine how many times you guys did the same as well. The famous video, ironically posted on a social media platform that we all know as YouTube, was posted by Gary Chirk entitled Look Up. And this states that this media we call social is anything but. When we open our computers and it's our doors we shut. The video is one in hundreds that explains the way in which social media is addictive and negative. This video turned into a worldwide sensation in 2014, reaching over 50 million views, grabbing everyone's attention. Social media has negatively changed our culture for one of the most obvious reasons, cyberbullying. It wasn't long ago that most people didn't have a computer in their own home, and now every other person you come across seems to have one. The website Internet Safety accounts for 43% of teens aged 13 to 17 have reported that they have experienced some sort of um, cyberbullying in the past year, and 95% of social media using teens who have witnessed cruel behavior on social networking sites say they have seen others ignore the behavior. Ryan Helligan, Tyler Clementi, Jessica Logan, Rachel Neblett, Kenneth Wesson Jr., and Grace McCombs are just ones of several names that have committed suicide due to cyberbullying. According to the Cyberbully Hotline, 20% of teens cyberbullied think about suicide, and 1 in 10 attempt it. Suicide is the number three killer of teens in the U.S., and over 4,500 teens commit suicide each year due to cyberbullying. A lot of teenagers do not know just how to handle the stress and anxiety with bullying over social media and oftentimes resort to suicide. With all this information, it brings me to my last and final claim, social media's diminishing privacy. Many users feel as if their personal data is safe on social networking sites, yet these sites encourage people to be more public with their personal lives. Young adults tend to overlook privacy policies when creating social media sites and are unaware that their information is at risk of disclosure to third parties. A study from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts shows that mobile social networks are giving data about users' physical locations to tracking sites and other social networking services. In an article by the Boston Globe, it demonstrated how social networks like Facebook can leak privacy. Two MIT students constructed a method for analyzing a person's networking website to be able to reliably determine whether the man was gay or not. The method was due to the friends he kept and was regardless of whether he identified his sexual orientation to Facebook. The research was done with a software program that looked at a person's friends and used statistical analysis to make a prediction. This method demonstrates the way in which information can be leaked across social media sites. 
Even though we don't explicitly state facts about our lives, characteristics can be made by discovering indications in our online profiles that are private. This implies that one's so-called private profile is not so private after all. In conclusion, I would like to stress that social media has changed our culture amongst young adults in America negatively. Social media is proven to be addictive, cyberbullying results from social media, and a, mass, a vast amount of privacy is diminishing due to social media. All right, Isabella, all of the structural stuff is very solid. I like the uh, statistical information you use as an attention device. There's a very clear preview of what the supporting points are going to be, and you signpost the points as you get to each of them, so the body of the speech is easy to follow. Um, uh, the material on the first point mostly documents that social media is widely used and that, uh, you know, especially among uh, young people. And then you've got kind of a hypothetical about your own experience. Actually, it's more a personal example of your own experience, like while you're working on the presentation, uh, which I think, you know, does demonstrate that people use it. What's problematic is that I'm not sure that you've shown that it's particularly addictive. Three hours a day, if you were watching television for three hours a day, if you were reading the newspaper for three hours a day, if you're on your phone with your friends for three hours a day, if you were uh, hanging out after school for three hours a day, would that be addictive? The mere fact that they're using it for a particular period of time, or what seems like a large period of time, I'm not sure demonstrates that it's addictive. And even if it is addictive, that doesn't demonstrate that there's any particular harm. Uh, that seems to be largely assumed. I thought you did uh, a much stronger job on the second point, uh, indicating about the bullying issue and the frequency with which people encounter bullying online. You did have one uh, estimate about the number of kids who would kill themselves each year because of cyberbullying that I didn't get the source site on, but uh, you did have some examples that you cited, uh, you know, like I said, of specific instances that worked pretty well on that. There's an explanation of it. The um, the, the criteria by which you are defining uh, cyberbullying, I think, is a little bit broad. Uh, you know, that there's somebody who says something negative or uh, cruel online. Does that count as cyberbullying? I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the same sort of thing that is causing people to uh, kill themselves. Um, so, again, the question of how widespread it is, I think you, you make a, a reasonable argument on that, um, much stronger than you had on the first point. And then on the privacy issue, uh, I think you've got a couple of good examples. I think you need to demonstrate that what the consequences of those privacy uh, invasions are, whether it is people being directly marketed to or that information could be used in some way that damages people. The only example that you've got is that somebody created an algorithm to predict whether or not some but he's gay, and uh, you know, again, I don't, I don't know how many people are closeted and would feel that they were harmed in some way if that came out. If they are uh, openly gay and it's identified, well, then why is that a particular harm to them, especially if they've done the self-identification in addition to what this uh, program says? But I think you've got a good illustration of how information <coughs> can start to be used. What you want to tell us is how that information, if it is used, could be problematic for people. I think that that's a little bit lacking. I thought you had excellent evidence. You cited it pretty consistently. Um, you're doing a lot of reading, though. There's not really any eye contact with the audience, and so you want to be careful about that. All right. Thank you.